Welcome to our ongoing series of videos on the analysis of parallel chord trusses. This is from Chapter 7, Section 1, Subsection 6, focusing on the analysis of a modified Warren truss with shallow end webs. This is perhaps the most common truss geometry that is used in standard steel trusses. In order to accommodate ductwork and other things, we often see a configuration like the following. Um, this basic pattern of web members going like this, first up, then down, then up, then down, is called a Warren truss, named after the person that uh, invented the geometry. But it also is very suggestive of its name because each of these zigzags looks like a W. Um, we call this a modified truss, because, Warren truss, because in addition to these zigzagging truss webs, there are also verticals installed in every other bay. Um, these verticals help to support the top cord to prevent bending and buckling in the vertical direction. Um, they're often left out on the bottom um, because it's presumed under gravity loads at least that the bottom cord is in tension um, so it doesn't need bracing against buckling and it also uh, is not directly loaded by decking. Uh, in the case of the top cord, um, the decking rests on the top cord is in, in, and is inducing bending in the top cord, so the additional support points there are fairly crucial for resisting bending. Having said all that, under wind suction it's not at all uncommon for this bottom cord to go into compression and therefore even though it may not have bending in it, it still is vulnerable to buckling and it has to be analyzed and sized accordingly under wind suction. We're going to focus our attention in this particular exercise on gravity and we have our usual distributed forces across the top here. A 1P force at all the interior joints there and there and there and so forth and then a half P force at the ends uh, indicative of the fact that because there's not another member over here this vertex does not get another half a P force. But there are 20 bays there are 20 1P forces downward, and the reactions on each end are 12P. And we've labeled our joints uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and so forth. Um, and we'd like to put these labels right on the joints, but there's going to be so much other stuff going on the, on the truss that we've sort of pulled them off above in order to uh, get them out of the way and allow us to focus on the force system. So you need to sort of, in your mind, make the connection that this joint is joint E. There's one other distinctive thing about this truss. You'll notice that at the end there is a final web member which is extended one bay further out and this web member has a different slope. Uh, we often see that configuration at the end of a, a truss joists of this sort, um, which uh, aids us in getting the proper uh, coordination of the forces at the end of this joint, at the end of this truss. In other words, we will have something like a bearing wall or a column coming up. If it's a column, it will have a bearing plate on the top of it or a top plate. And we would like the force along the center line of the column to intersect at exactly the same point as the force in the top cord and the force in this web member. We call that point of intersection the working point for the design of the truss. If you don't design the, the truss end bearing assembly so that that can happen, then you will have a moment or some eccentric force on the last joint which will cause rotation of the joint and induce severe moments in that last web member and in the top cord member. It's often uh, very helpful 
to have this last web member at a shallower slope, which tends to accommodate the design of that end bearing assembly so that the coordination of all those forces uh, passing through a single point can be achieved. So there are two significant changes we've made. We no longer have all the diagonals going in the same direction. Some are going this way, some are going that way. And that means some of these are in compression, some of them are in tension. Uh, assuming that they've been designed properly so that they have adequate cross-section or not particularly vulnerable to buckling. Uh, the members that are working in compression, like this one and that one and that one, are going to be safe against buckling and this geometry will make sense. And again, one of the motives for this geometry is to create these openings, uh, which occasionally we like to run ductwork or other things through. So we're going to analyze this truss and we're going to have an interesting situation right near the end. Right off the bat we're going to have a member which has a different slope from anything we've looked at so far. Um, all these members are at 45 degrees. This dimension we're going to call S. That makes this dimension S also. So this is S, 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 S and S. Now that means if we're going to look at the slope of this particular member, it's two horizontal units over for one vertical unit. So the forces in order to be along this member have to be on a triangle which is in proportion of two to one. Since this is two and that's one, the forces have to be two to one also. So when we come to this joint, if we just look at the reaction and the applied force, we have a net force of 11.5 P upward on the joint due to the applied force and the reaction. That means this member has to be pulling down on the joint with a vertical component of 11.5 P. Once we've established that this vertical component is 11.5 P, by the geometry of this triangle or by the slope of this member, the horizontal component has to be twice that much or 23p in order to produce a net force along it. Then we can use the Pythagorean theorem uh, in order to resolve what's happening on the total force in this member. So this member, because it's pulling down on this joint, it can't pull unless it's in tension because the joint will be pulling back on it. So we resolve the total force as 25.7 P and it has to be in tension. So that's, this member is pulling on this joint. The joint is pulling back on the member to be in equilibrium. The member has to have a force on the other end that's equal and opposite. And that force is applied by this joint. And if this joint is pulling on this member, then the member must be pulling back on the joint. So that's the first force that we're going to resolve at joint A. We have one other member that's contributing and its role is crucial because at this moment we have a 23P horizontal component of this diagonal that's pulling to the right on joint A. Joint A to be kept in equilibrium needs to have a 23P force to the left which can only be supplied by that member right there. So we're going to show a force to the left being exerted by this member. The member is pushing on the joint. The joint has to be pushing back on the member, which means the member is in compression. In order for the member to stay in equilibrium, it has to have a force on the right end, which is to the left. That force is being applied by joint C. So joint C is pushing to the left on the member, that means the member is pushing to the right on joint C, and all of those forces are 23P. Now, we could jump down to this joint, but we have a whole bunch of vertical forces and a whole bunch of horizontal forces. So this joint is the most complex of any of them here, and we have very little information there. 
So rather than go to that joint, we're going to try this one instead. We go to joint C and we see we have one unknown horizontal, a horizontal from this diagonal and a vertical from the diagonal. So we have only one unknown vertical. So we're going to do the usual thing that we do with parallel cord trusses. We're going to immediately resolve the vertical forces. So when I look at this joint, it has a 1P downward force. The only element that can equilibrate that is this member, which means this member has to be pushing up on the joint with a vertical component that is 1P in magnitude. So, excuse me, I'm jumping around here. All right, so I show that force upward from the diagonal. Its vertical component is 1P. By geometry now, this member has a slope of 45 degrees, so the horizontal and the vertical have to be equal. So we write 1P for the horizontal component uh, as the horizontal component of this force. Now that force is being exerted on the joint by the member. The member, the joint must be pushing back on the member with an equal and opposite force. So the member is in compression. Uh, in order to keep it in equilibrium, it has to have a force on its lower end, which is equal and opposite to the force on the upper end. That force is exerted. It's a push being exerted by joint B. If joint B is pushing up on the member, up and to the left, then the member must be pushing down and to the right on joint B. So we've now resolved the vertical forces at joint C. We have only horizontal forces to resolve and what we're going to see here at this joint is really unusual because normally when we work, work across a truss like this the cord forces are getting progressively larger. But because of the really oddball nature of this member it's like a little strut that's providing the vertical component to support this joint against this one play applied force. But in the process, because of the angle that this member is at, it's actually pushing up and to the left. So it's actually helping to take some of the horizontal force from this member here. So when we look at the joint, there's a 23P force to the right. There's a 1P horizontal force to the left which leaves a total of 22P to the right. This member is the only member that can equilibrate that. It must be pushing to the left with a 22P force. So the member is pushing to the left on the joint, the joint's pushing to the right on the member because it's pushing on the member, the member's in compression and the member is passing that force through to joint D. Now, again, we still have too many unknowns down here, but fortunately joint D is really simple. Um, it has one unknown vertical, one unknown horizontal. This member right here has to be equilibrating the 1P downward force. This member right here has to be equilibrating this 22P force to the right, which is being exerted by the member here. So first we resolve that horizontal force by saying, excuse me, the vertical force, by saying this 1P force is equilibrated by this force, which is exerted upward by this member pushing on the joint. The joint has to be pushing backward on that member. So that member is in compression and it's passing that force through to joint B and B is pushing back on the member to keep it in equilibrium and achieve this state of compression. Now we can resolve the horizontal components by saying that this member has to be bucking against this member because they're the only two horizontal influences on this joint and they have to be balancing each other. So we see the first interesting thing having to do with this kind of geometry with these vertical elements. The vertical elements are always 1P forces. They're like little columns that are just going up to support this 1P applied force but they're not influencing the overall action of the truss because when we cross this joint, there's no horizontal component from this member. So the horizontal, this member can't throw additional horizontal force into the top cord member. So this member is not part of the sort of primary truss action 
it could be taken out and the truss would be fine, except that this member would have to be able to absorb this additional load in bending and also be safe against buckling uh, when this member was gone. So this member is providing a local benefit, but it's not part of the overall spanning process. And the other thing is every time we pass just one vertical member and there's no diagonal on the joint, we don't change the force in the cord and going from the left side to the right side of that joint. Now we have enough information to jump down to this joint and we can actually resolve things because we have only one unknown vertical now and that's the vertical in this member. But we got a bunch of messy stuff going on here. Um, so we just need to make sure we don't forget something. And the arithmetic's not too bad. When we look at the vertical forces that exist on joint B, there's an upward force of 11.5 P from this member, which is pulling up and to the left. So that's 11.5 P. Then we have a diagonal that's pushing down with a vertical component of 1 P. And then we have this vertical member that's pushing down with a vertical component of 1P. So the vertical component of this member must be 11.5 minus 1 minus 1, or in other words, 9.5. So we write 9.5 on the vertical. By geometry now, we got a 45 degree angle, so this horizontal is 9.5. We can resolve those members. But we know this member is pushing down on the joint, so the joint is pushing back on the member. So the member is in compression, and it's transferring that force through, so that it also pushes on joint E and with this force. Now we have to resolve the horizontals at this joint. Um, and again, we got a bunch of them to account for. We got 23P to the left from this member, pulling upward and to the left. We got a 1P to the right from this member. We have no horizontal component from this vertical force. And then we have 9.5 to the left. So we got 23 plus 9.5 is 32.5. And then we're going to subtract off this 1P, which is going in the other direction. So we get 31.5 as the net. So again, we'll run through that. 23 to the left, 9.5 to the left, 1P to the right. You add all those up, you get 23.5P. And this member must be pulling to the right on joint B. So joint B is pulling back on it, which means this member is working in tension, and that tension force gets transferred through. So it is pulling to the right on joint B, pulling to the left on joint F. We don't have enough information to resolve this joint, but we can jump up here and we see we have one unknown vertical, and we have a 9.5 P upward force, a 1 P downward force, which leaves an 8.5p downward force from this member. So 8.5p for the vertical component of that force added to this 1p force, which is also downward. Those equilibrate the 9.5p upward force uh, due to the vertical component of this member. All right, so <clears throat> this is continued on through in this diagram. Uh, again, you'll notice every time we cross a vertical, we have a 1P force in compression in this little vertical column. And the cord forces don't change when going across that joint. But what does happen, which is quite interesting, is when we cross a joint like this, we have a really abrupt change from 22P all the way up to 40 because there are two diagonal web members framing into that joint and they're both contributing substantial components. In this case, 9.5, in that case, 8.5. So when you add those together, you get 18 and you add that 18 to the 22, you get 40. The other thing you might notice as a pattern 
is that this chord member is always somewhere between that one and that one. In other words, we take, we're, we're lolling along for a while, we take a jump up and going there, we take an, another jump up and going there, and another jump up and going here. So, this is the rest of that truss all the way to the center, and this is points U and T, or joints U and T, define the center of this truss. You'll notice that we reached a tensile chord force of 71.5 P uh, on just to the left of this joint and just to the right for the bottom chords. For the top chord, we got up to 72 P in compression. And we got our usual check here for the web forces in that once we passed over this symmetry line, we discovered that the force in this diagonal was just equal to the force in that diagonal. And the vertical components have to be 0.5 in order to equilibrate this 1p downward force. We have a 1p force coming down in this member, and these two diagonals are each contributing a half a p upward force. We know we have to have symmetry there. We know those two vertical components have to add up to this one, so they have to be 0.5 exactly as we expected. And as usual, we have that beautiful check on the web forces, but we don't have a, a similarly simple check on the chord forces, but we do have the method of sections which allows us to do that. So this is our overall truss. We're going to go to the symmetry line and we're going to slice through the members just in the bay to the left of the symmetry line. So you'll notice we're keeping joint S, um, and unfortunately this was called joint T, and I have relabeled it as V, and the reason I had to relabel joint T as V is because I want to use T as my symbol for the tensile force in the bottom. So I have a compressive force in the top chord, tensile force in the bottom chord, and a diagonal force D. So I'm gonna do two checks this time just to be unbelievably thorough. I'm gonna take moments about joint S. So this is joint S right here. C and D pass through that joint. So the only unknown force that's gonna enter the equation is T. So I'm gonna put my cursor right there for the moment and I'm gonna ask what are the moments about that joint? And I look to the left and I have a 12p upward force, which is tending to create clockwise motion about that joint. This is the 12p force. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 bays. So the lever arm is 11s. So it's plus for clockwise. 12p for the force times the lever arm, which is 11s. Now, this minus 0.5p force is tending to produce counterclockwise moment about joint S. So I'm going to put a minus sign for counterclockwise. The magnitude of the force is 0.5p. And again, the lever arm is 11s because these two forces are all along the same line of action. They have the same lever arm relative to joint S. So the lever arm is 11s. Then we have 11p, which is tending to produce a counterclockwise moment, so we put minus 11p times its lever arm, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5s. And finally, about joint s, we have a force t, which is tending to produce a counterclockwise moment, so I put minus t times its lever arm, which is the vertical distance from, or the perpendicular distance, from the line of action of T to the joint S about which we're taking moments. So that's minus T times the lever arm S. We can cancel out all the S's and take the T over to the other side, change its sign to plus, and 12 times 11 is 132.5 times 11 is 5.5, minus 11 times 5 is minus 55, and when we add all that up, we get plus 71.5p, the plus meaning, yes, it is tension and it is in the direction that we've shown.
Then there's an equation down here, which you can check for yourself, which is taking moments about this joint right here, which means that D and T are passing through that joint and they make no contribution because they have no lever arm, so they don't enter the moment equation, but the force C does, and it's tending to produce a counterclockwise moment about that joint, which is minus C times S. So when you run all these numbers with all these lever arms, you get 72P, which is what we were expecting. That ends our video on the analysis of a modified Warren truss with shallow end webs.